I think all of us, brothers and sisters, are anticipating that the events that we're witnessing are a prelude to the big things that we know are coming, to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to raise the dead, to give rewards to those that have served their God faithfully, and to completely change this world, to turn it upside down, to get rid of all of the wickedness and the corruption and the carnality and the violence that we're seeing around us. And so our title tonight is Dramatic Events and Realignments in the Middle East in 2023. We should always start a subject like this, brothers and sisters, with this foundation. For Yahweh's eyes are upon the land from one moment to another, 365 days a year. That's the testimony of Deuteronomy 11 and verse 12. A land which Yahweh thy God careth for. The eyes of Yahweh thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And the other two uh, passages that are quoted on the screen. Psalm 121 and verse 4 testifies that behold he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. And we've just read from Zechariah chapter 2. In Zechariah 2 verse 8 we read those words for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. And yet we're witnessing brothers and sisters some terrible things on both sides of the current conflict. Thousands of deaths in relation to what's happening in the Gaza Strip and well over a thousand deaths in Israel in savage circumstances. And you see, as we're going to point out at the end of our study tonight, the terrible things that have come and will come upon God's own people in the land are deserved. They are corrupt. There is ungodliness in Jacob. And so what we're seeing is also part of the divine judgments upon his own people. And we'll see that in its context tonight. And yet we know that this is his land and they are his people. And the day will come when he will redeem a remnant from them. And they will be like us in that day, brothers and sisters, in possession of the truth. And they will be in the land promised to their fathers. We know that that's the outcome that our God has in store for them. But there's going to be a lot of pain to be experienced between now and then. So here's a brief timeline of what has happened since the 7th of October. It was a quiet Sabbath morning on the 7th of October and my wife and three other members of our family were there in the old city of Jerusalem on that morning. We wondered why it was so quiet. We wondered why there were so many sirens going off. We wondered why there were so many sonic booms above our head. We had no idea that there was a war going on. But in the morning, Hamas had begun to fire rockets into Israel. And by midday, they had fired something like two and a half thousand of them, aimed at the southern cities of Israel. They were raining down where they got through the Iron Dome system, and most of them didn't. Israel's Iron Dome, of course, is world famous. It destroyed most of those two and a half thousand rockets in the first six hours, but not all. At around 11 a.m., two rockets were downed over the old city, and I was actually walking back towards the Jaffa Gate. And I looked up, and you could see the puffs in the air, and then you got the boom. The Iron Dome had brought down two Hamas rockets directly above my head. But, of course, by the grace of God, we were able to get out the next day on our scheduled flight. And shortly afterwards, of course, the airport was closed. By that time, of course, hundreds of Israelis, men, women and children, had been slaughtered in kibbutzim and other places near Gaza. It's been called an unprecedented massacre. The world loves using that term, don't they? Unprecedented nowadays. And I'm going to use it in the, in the title for my next study, God willing, because we are witnessing what I really unprecedented things. Well-trained and armed Hamas fighters broke through the security fence with explosives and they captured and killed several Israeli soldiers at the border, dragging some of them out of a tank. Others rode motorbikes or armoured trucks or utes as we would call them, or on hang gliders flew into Israel and attacked local towns that were just a few kilometres away from the Gaza border. And those settlements were mainly kibbutzim. And they went into those kibbutzim and they killed indiscriminately 
as they went. And there were at least 1,500 Hamas soldiers, trained men, doing that. The, the heartbreak, the misery, the carnage is almost indescribable. I think the word unprecedented in many ways, at least for Jews in the land, is quite fitting. Victims were slaughtered in their homes, in bomb shelters. You know, they threw grenades into bomb shelters where people were trying to get away. And in an outdoor event, 260 people at that outdoor event, a music festival they called it, it was a little more than that. There was a bit more carnality involved in it than that. And so 260 people lost their lives at that event uh, and many others were actually taking, taken hostage at that event. And unusually, Israeli forces were slow to respond. But they finally, after two or three days, killed 1,500 Hamas terrorists whose bodies lay in the streets of those of those towns and kibbutzim for a couple of days before they were collected. And they're counting the cost. By the time the IDF, the Israel Defence Force, had eradicated all remaining Hamas terrorists, over 1,200 Israelis had been killed. About 200, they say 199, but probably will be about 200, taken as hostages into Gaza. Their lives, of course, are unlikely to be preserved in the coming events. We don't know, but it's unlikely that they will survive. And many southern cities, such as Ashdod and Ashkelon and even, even uh, Tel Aviv, and, in fact, a little place called rishon le Zion. It was the first kibbutz built in Israel. rishon le Zion means the first to Zion. And it was, it was uh, built by Jews who came in the 19th century uh, to, back to the land, and there is a little group of Christadelphians who live in rishon le Zion. And, thankfully, they are safe. Israel responded by shutting off all access and utilities into the Gaza Strip. And Prime Minister Netanyahu declared war on Hamas. And a general call-up of reserve soldiers was instituted with a view to a ground invasion of Gaza after the bombing uh, has ceased. And they're still bombing. They have sent troops in on some missions, but they haven't yet, as I understand it at this point, started the all-out ground invasion of Gaza. It won't be too long before that begins. On the 13th of October, under pressure from the international community, Israel gave a warning to people living in the northern area of the Gaza Strip to flee south. And they've given them now five days. Well, since Hamas seized power in Gaza from Fatah, another Palestinian political party, in 2005, there have been several vicious conflicts between Israel and the rulers of Gaza. They were in 2006, 2008, 2014 and 2021. And during every one of those, other powers such as the United States of America, the European Union nations, the UK and certainly the United Nations have insisted that Israel cease fire and withdraw forces before Hamas could be effectively weakened or eliminated. That's why the heading of that slide is the difference or differences this time. This time that the horror of Hamas's massacre of innocent civilians has changed the attitude of many countries, including, by the way, some Arab countries, which is amazing. While trumpeting human rights, Many nations now say that Israel has its own rights, the right to defend itself, the right to take some revenge, the right to recover its hostages, etc. And so they're getting quite a deal of support. Now this particular chart picture, as you can see from the bottom right hand corner, was in the Daily Mail, it's an Australian publication, for today, the 18th of October 2023. And they have used the colour scheme here. The blue on the left-hand side represents those powers, such as America uh, and Saudi Arabia, for example, who are giving support to Israel. Whereas on the right-hand side, the red, are nations who are likely, of course, either to be involved already or may yet be involved in the conflict. Lebanon, 
which harbours, of course, Hezbollah, which has 26,000 rockets aimed at Israel. Iran, the supporter, the, the funder of Hamas and of Hezbollah. China and, of course, Russia, who will always take a position that is uncomfortable for the West, even though, of course, we know that maybe they're not quite as interested as some think they are. So what about the mood in Israel? Israel has been a socialist left-wing society since its inception in 1948, with just brief periods of right-wing governments. And if you've read Benjamin Netanyahu's autobiography, Bibi, My Story, and I would thoroughly recommend it, the left-wing, he complains very often in that book about the left-wing socialist bias of his country. The press is totally left-wing. The police force is left-wing. The judiciary is left-wing, which is why, of course, they're trying to change matters in relation to who elects or who appoints Supreme Court judges in Israel. The secular Jews are largely left in their political stance, hence the strident opposition, as I said, to those judicial reforms. And that division over those reforms was one reason for Israel not being prepared. They were caught off guard by Hamas. You know what was happening in Israel? There were soldiers saying, we're not going to fight for our country. Oh, that changed on the 7th of October. Now that division has been set aside for the time being for just sheer survival purposes because that nation feels as though this is a crunch time for them and it probably is. So there's a, a bit of a review of what has happened and now we want to talk about the scriptural perspective of this. So what relationship do these events have to prophecy? Well again it's necessary to lay foundations. Amos 3 verses 6 and 7 says this. Shall the trumpet be blown in a city and the people not be afraid? That's certainly true. Shall evil befall a city and Yahweh hath not done it? In relation to his people, that's always the case. Surely the Lord Yahweh will do nothing but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Now the reason for putting up that particular passage, brothers and sisters and young people, is this. That when we come to look at the events that are happening, there's no point in offering opinions about what may happen because my experience is that it usually it turns out to be the opposite. But it's very important to know what the scripture says will happen. And so we're going to lay out before you tonight some scriptures that, that will, I believe, show the path forward. Now we don't know the twists and the turns that it will take to get to that point, but we do know what Yahweh wants to achieve. He has revealed that somewhere in the word, and we're going to see just some places this evening. The violence that has descended on Israel's cities is clearly part of God's plan for the future. That passage makes that clear, doesn't it? There is obviously an objective in the divine mind. He's got the angels at work to achieve an objective. And Yahweh's plans are revealed in the word. So let's search for them. And I'm going to start, of course, with the the old problem, the, the two-state solution to the problem between Israel and the Palestinians. And many nations, including United Nations, still cling to that policy of a two-state solution. They, they say that there has to be a place for the Palestinians to live. So what does the Bible say about that? Well, let's do some exploring, shall we? Now, I'd love to hear some pages of the Bible being turned tonight. It's one of those sad things that sometimes nowadays we don't hear too much of that in our meetings. We need to hear the pages of the Bible turning. I want you to look at three references with me. And what we're going to do is we're going to examine the context of these references very carefully because context is always, and I emphasise always, the arbiter of any proper right interpretation of the Bible. And when you don't apply the context, you're likely to get it wrong. So let's do this. The first one of those references is Joel chapter 3. Joel 3 and verse 4. Now, we're all familiar with Joel 3. We quote it quite frequently in relation to Armageddon, and rightfully so. Because, as you will see from verse 2, there is a reflection in the wording 
from what we are going to read later on in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 2. I will gather, he says, all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, or the judgment of Yah, as that name means, and will plead or judge them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So there's no doubt about the context. It's Armageddon. Now, if there was any doubt about that, verse 14 would resolve that, maybe verses 13 and 14. Because verse 13 says, Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of threshing. It says decision in the King James. It actually should be rendered threshing. You see, he's using a sickle to cut down some kind of harvest of grain. And it's a time when there are multitudes being cut down. That word multitudes, by the way, is hanom, hemonym. The I-M on the end is the plural. Multitudes, plural. It's the word hamon that is used in Ezekiel 39 in the valley of hamon Gog, where there will be, of course, a place of the burial of Gog's army. So it's clear. This is a context about Armageddon. Armageddon means, doesn't it, a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. Well, there's no doubt about Joel 3. It's about Armageddon. So in that context, you come to verse 4. Verse 4 says, Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon? Now that's interesting because, you see, one of Israel's biggest problems today is the Hezbollah in Lebanon. And if you go and have a look where most of the Hezbollah are, guess where they are? Tyre and Zidon. Yeah, so I'm not going to talk about that particular aspect tonight, but it's interesting that that should be there at the beginning of that verse. And all the coasts of Palestine. Now, I don't need to read any more than that. Because Palestine doesn't exist today as a state. Don't believe what you see in the United Nations when they hold up the banner saying the state of Palestine. They are not a member of the United Nations. They are not a nation state. They have never been declared a nation state. They don't have a nation. They don't have a place to have a nation. But it's pretty obvious that at the time of Armageddon there will be a nation called Palestine. It says, all the coasts of Palestine. Now, it can't be in the West Bank because the West Bank doesn't have a coastline. The closest the green line gets to the Mediterranean is nine miles or whatever that is in kilometres. That doesn't have a coastline. So it can only be one place, can't it? The Gaza Strip, the ancient land of the Philistines and Palestine, of course, comes from the name Philistine. And it was given to Judea in BC 136 or thereabouts after the Bar Kokhba revolution when the Romans utterly destroyed Jerusalem, so it was sold, etc., they gave the name to Judea of Palestine out of hatred. They wanted to put the Jews down. So they, they called them Palestinians, Philistines. So, yeah, what do you think about Joel 3, verse 4? I know what I think about it. It's pretty clear. And if that's all we had you'd say, well, you may be, but that's not all we've got. We've got two more. So I want you to come then to the next one, Zephaniah chapter 2. Now, Zephaniah chapter 2, the chapter division, by the way, should be at the end of verse 3. The first three verses of chapter 2 belong to chapter 1. The chapter really begins in verse 4. For Gaza, oh, hang on, Gaza, right up front. For Gaza shall be forsaken and Ashkelon a desolation. And, and there's a play on words here, the, the names, the meaning of the names. You know, the, there's an irony in the way that the names are used. We won't go into that detail now. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday and Ekron shall be rooted up. So here we've got a piece of land that used to belong to the Philistines. Now, now, what's this prophecy about? What, what's the era in which it is to be fulfilled? Because it goes on to talk about the fate of the people that live in this place. But I want to establish right up front what era it's in. So come down to verse 11 
of Zephaniah 2. Verse 11 says this, Yahweh will be terrible unto them, and the them are those who are listed from verse 4 to verse 10. He will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth. Now what that means, of course, is that the gods of the earth are starved. Now how do you starve gods of the earth? Well, you take away their worshippers. You take away their devotees. There's no one worshipping them. How can you be a god if you don't have any devotees? See, read on. It says in that verse, and it says men, it's in italics, you'll see it's not actually in the Hebrew, but we'll read it. And men shall worship him, namely Yahweh, everyone from his place, even all the isles of the nations. Now that's universal, that means everyone. So what era of time do you think that is? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's the kingdom era. It's the kingdom age. So therefore, the prophecy from verse 4 to 10 is going to happen at the time of Armageddon because Zephaniah is all about the divine judgments that will begin at Armageddon. Chapter 1 is very clear about that, as indeed is chapter 3 in verse 8. So given that that's the context, let's read on then into verse 5. Of Zephaniah 2. Woe well unto the inhabitants of the sea coast. Oh, now that's interesting. This place has got a sea coast. The nation. Oh, now that's interesting. It's called a nation. It means that they've got national status, that they've been recognised universally as a nation. And it goes on to say the nation of the Carathites. So who were they? Well, their name actually means the executioners. I think that might suit another crowd called Hamas. Don't you reckon? The executioners. The word of Yahweh is against you, O Canaan. And this is how it should read. There's a little word missed out here in the translation. O Canaan of the land of the Philistines, from which you get Palestine. I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. Their future doesn't look very bright, does it? And the sea coast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds for flocks. I wonder whose flocks? Well, if you go to Ezekiel 47 and 48, you find out who. The tribes of Israel that will be settled in the cantons or the divisions of the land in the future. It will be Jews who take over this area of the land of Canaan as it was once called and the flock and the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah it says in verse 7 that they shall feed thereupon in the house of Ashkelon they shall lie down in the evening for Yahweh their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity and it goes on to talk about Moab and Ammon and so on which we won't bother with now got a bit of a feel what have we got we've got a people called Palestinians or Philistines in the latter days there are no Philistines around today but there are Palestinians we've got a place that's got a coast and they're called a nation and they're about to be removed from it so that the Jews can inhabit it that's what we got come along to that third reference you can see on the screen Ezekiel chapter 25 Now we could start this from verse 12 because it's about Edom, the judgment on Edom. And you'll see that name used in the second line of verse 12 and again in the third line of verse 13. It's not a bad idea to highlight that in your Bible. Now why Edom, do you think? Well Edom is the prophetic name that Yahweh gives to all anti-Semitic powers and people who seek the destruction of Israel. We've just been reading through Ezekiel, Ezekiel 35, 36, very clear about that. You go to Isaiah 34, very clear about that. It's picked up in the Apocalypse, that language of Isaiah 34, to refer to Babylon the Great. Why? Because the Catholic system is the greatest persecutor in history of the Jewish people. And Brother Thomas says in Eureka, in several places he says, 
that when Gog comes into the land, he will be, at that time, he says, the head of the house of Esau. They seek the destruction of Israel. But when Gog's destroyed, he adds, the headship of the Edomites of the latter days will return to its rightful owner, the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. So when you read Edom or Esau in the prophecies, always think anti-Semites. Who was the first anti-Semite? Esau. He hated his brother Jacob, the father of Israel. He wanted to kill Jacob. He becomes the type, the vehicle in the prophetic scriptures for anyone that seeks the destruction of Israel. Now that's the context. So verses 12, 13 and 14, where Edom is mentioned twice again, is all about anti-Semitic powers seeking the destruction of God's people. Come to verse 15. This is where the attention turns to another people who do the, who do the same, that is, seek to destroy God's people. Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, verse 15, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge, now let's just put that in modern language, because the Palestinians have dealt by revenge, and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred. I mean, you couldn't write it better than that, could you? It would be impossible to describe what's happening right now any better than that. It's happening because of the old hatred. Now, what, what era are we in? Is this past history? Read on. Verse 16, therefore thus saith Adonai Yahweh, behold, I will stretch out mine hand upon the Philistines, read in our language, Palestinians, and I will cut off the Kerithims, read executioners, because that's what the name means, and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. So there's the third time we've read about a seacoast in relation to a name called Philistine or Palestine. So what era are we in? Read verse 17. And I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes and they shall know that I am Yahweh when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. When could that be, do you think? Yesterday? Or tomorrow? And it's got to be, doesn't it, at the return of Christ? that that people will recognise that God has intervened in the affairs of his people because they have attempted to destroy them for the old hatred. Brothers and sisters and young people, each of those contexts concerns the latter days and events involving the redemption of Israel. And everyone mentions a seacoast using the name Philistine or Palestine, which the Romans gave to the Jews initially, but now we know who that identifies. And they are brutal people, because they're called Kerithims or Kerithites, executioners, and they're executing because of the old hatred. Anyone prepared to argue that that's not a prophecy of the present and of the near future? Each of these passages presages the existence of a nation with a name associated with the Philistines. But I don't think there's any doubt that the scripture is telling us where that's all going to end up. It's not going to be very comfortable for them. And indeed not for God's own people because of their wickedness as we shall see. There's going to be a lot of destruction. It's not ours, brothers and sisters, to join the humanists of this world and to say, oh, this is awful. It is awful. We know it's awful. We hate the violence. We hate seeing people, especially innocent families, destroyed like they are being destroyed right now. But it has to happen. It's part of God's plan. It's part of his will. And we stand aside from politics. We stand aside from humanists. We don't care about them. All we care about is the fulfilment of the word of God. And it's happening before our very eyes. Now I'm going to take you back in history. If you think that what I've just said is new, you're wrong. I'm going to go right back six years 
six years ago. You see the date of the Debka article there? 16th of December 2017. And I used this in a series that I did in early 2018. That's how far that goes back. Palestinian claims that Jerusalem lose Saudi as well as US support. Now this was the time, of course, of the first year of the presidency of Donald Trump, which changed a lot of things. The article read this way. The Palestinians have three major grievances with the Trump administration on Jerusalem, but what is really irking them even more is its endorsement by their long-standing champion, Riyadh. Now, Riyadh, of course, is the capital of Saudi Arabia. Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who was a Jew, has reached an understanding with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Now, they call him, commonly nowadays, MBS. So when you hear that acronym, MBS, it's a reference to the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. He's made a lot of changes in Saudi Arabia, and he's working on it. On a new plan for resolving the Israel-Arab conflict, which departs fundamentally from the traditional core issues that scuttled all past peace processes. Now, it was the emerging peace agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia that many commentators attribute to be one of the major reasons for the Hamas attack on Israel on the 7th of October. They wanted to try and stop what was happening because President Biden is determined, he wants to be re-elected, he's determined to get an agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia before he has to go to an election. The angels are brilliant, aren't they? They're brilliant in the way that they can manipulate men's political ambitions for the divine purpose. So this is how yesterday's news mirrors today's headlines. As I said, Biden is determined to seal the Saudi-Israeli pact that they're working on at the moment. But let's go back again. This is the 14th of November 2017. This is what it said in relation to the Saudi document laying out plans for peace with Israel. Lebanese newspaper Al Akbar exposed Tuesday morning the secret document of the Saudi Foreign Ministry that it claims includes a roadmap towards rejuvenating the 2002 Saudi peace initiative and hints at meetings and understandings between Israeli and Saudi officials. Washington aims to mediate a peace agreement between Israel and the oil-rich kingdom. Now, of course, we know that Trump didn't succeed. Biden wants to succeed. The document, said to be signed by Foreign Minister Adel al jibir also allegedly confirms mutual visits by senior officials including the rumoured visit of the Saudi Crown Prince to Tel Aviv. That, did, that never happened. But that doesn't mean that nothing's happened. Let's just go back to that Debka report of the 16th of December 2017. Yeah, six years ago. But there's nothing new in what's happening right now. It's just the angels bringing it to a crescendo. The old Saudi Arab League peace plan of 2003 is a dead letter. Riyadh, that means Saudi Arabia, has dropped its demand that Israel accept a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. Now you can imagine what that would mean to the Palestinians, to Hamas, to Fatah, to the Palestinian Authority led by Mahmoud Abbas. You know, they would, they would choke on their dinner, wouldn't they, when they read that? Goes on to say this. Since the original Saudi peace proposal, which the prince, MBS, called Plan A, was dead, that was his view six years ago, it is necessary to move forward to Plan B. So what is Plan B? Plan B is essentially as follows. The state of Palestine would be established in the Gaza Strip, plus large tracts of territory to be annexed from northern Sinai. Egypt has agreed to this outline. This deal would essentially render irrelevant the Palestinian demand to restore the pre-1967 boundaries for their state. So they're going to get a state. It ain't going to be where they think it's going to be. And Jerusalem will not be its capital. So there's our three references, brothers and sisters and young people. Joel 3 verse 4 
Zephaniah 2 verses 4 to 7 with verse 11 telling you what the context is. And Ezekiel 25 verses 15 to 17, they are screaming at us that the outcome of what we're witnessing will be some kind of Palestinian state in the Gaza Strip. Now, it might take months, years, we don't know. We don't know the pain and the suffering and the twists and the turns that will have to be before that is accomplished, but it will be accomplished before Armageddon. And in my view, Armageddon is still a long way away. Not our removal to the judgment seat, that could be tomorrow. I think it may well happen in the next few weeks. The world's on the very verge of a great financial collapse and that will be the topic for our next study, God willing, if we're here in a fortnight's time. Because a fortnight's time will be into November and crashes always come in October. So we'll see. If it's not then, it won't be too long afterwards. The world knows that, as you're going to see in a fortnight's time if we're here. That's how important these things are, brothers and sisters. So what should we be looking for? The current conflict may well see the elimination of Hamas. You know why I believe that's got to be the case? Netanyahu's political career is over if he doesn't destroy Hamas. He's made that commitment. He's made the promise to his people. He's under fire for not being ready for the invasion that occurred on the 7th of October. The Israeli Defence Force, their intelligence services are under fire. People are blaming him. Israel's a left-wing nation. They hate Netanyahu. All right? They want to get rid of him. So he has to fulfil his promise. It, it won't matter how many Israeli soldiers it costs, because they've got to go through all of those tunnels. They're like worms, the Hamas people. They're underneath the Gaza Strip. They've got tunnels all over the place, stock full of rockets and now hostages as well. They've got to go through all those tunnels and weed them out. It's probably going to take months to do that. But he cannot do anything other than destroy Hamas. So that's going to happen. And what would follow that, do you think? Does Israel want to rule the Gaza Strip in its ruined condition with two million people? No, they don't. They don't want that to be part of Israel. I mean, two million Palestinians would vote Israeli politicians out of office. Can't have that. So some kind of Palestinian government, we believe, will have to be installed in the Gaza Strip and they'll be given additional land to the south to expand. Israel would leave Gaza but guarantee that no political coup like that of Hamas in 2005 and 6 would succeed again. In other words, they'd say, look, you want to live peacefully with Israel? You can govern yourself. You can be a nation state. We'll leave you alone. We'll supply you with what you need. But don't expect us not to come back if Hamas or anything like Hamas ever emerges again. So following the irreversible annexation of the West Bank by Israel, a distressed world would recognise the new state. So you've still introduced a new subject there, the subject of the West Bank, because that's where I'm going to go next. The peace required by Ezekiel 38, verses 8 to 12, would come to the land of Israel, and it must. Let's go to Ezekiel 38. We're not that far from it. The peace required by Ezekiel 38, verses 8 to 12. How far is Israel from this today? A long way. But it will come. Now, I'm going to read from verse 8 through to verse 12. I'm going to emphasise a couple of things. After many days, thou. So who's God addressing? Well, he's addressing Gog, isn't he? The Gog, the dictator of the Eurasian Confederacy that comes from the north. That's who he's addressing. Thou shalt be visited. It means that God's going to start to work in their affairs in a very real way. In the latter years, and we know that that phrase is also repeated in verse 16 in a different form. It's the latter days in verse 16. So we know what the, the era is. It's our time. They shall come into the land that is brought back from the sword so they have recovered themselves, is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. So in a moment I'm going to focus on that phrase. 
the mountains of Israel. Because it tells us something very important about the future. Which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely or securely, as that word means in the Hebrew. All of them. Not just some of them. All of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought. And by the way, we could go off on a tangent there because when you go through the prophecy of Isaiah, it's very clear that the pattern was set for today. Just like Ahaz refused Yahweh's help and sought the help of the Assyrians of old, so Israel will seek the help of the latter-day Assyrian, Russia. Vladimir Putin and Benjamin Netanyahu are like that. They're very close, which is why you have not heard of any problem between Russia and Israel over Syria when Israel is blasting Iranian installations and Syrian installations to smithereens in Syria. Not a whimper from Putin. Why? The latter day Ahaz will make his way to Moscow to do what Ahaz did, to make a covenant with the, the latter day Assyrian so that they can get protection from their enemies. Who were Ahaz's enemies? Oh, Israel in the north. Do you know that Hezbollah now inhabits a large portion of what used to be Israel in the north? the tribe of Naphtali. Did you know that? They are living on Israeli territory right now and they've got their rockets pointed from that territory towards Jerusalem. Who's the other enemy of Ahaz? Oh, the Syrians. Who's the last nation apart from the, from the Hezbollah in Lebanon? It's not Lebanon that hates Israel, by the way. It's the Hezbollah that are in Lebanon and Lebanon would like to kick them out. Who's the other nation that Israel has an enemy right now? Syria, the same as Ahaz of old. So the pattern was set. Before the Assyrian invasion, in the days of Hezekiah, there was an agreement between Ahaz of Judah, the faithless Ahaz, with the Assyrians to give them some kind of protection. It didn't work out quite like they thought, as it won't for Israel of the present. There's no greater evil thought, brothers and sisters, than to make a covenant and to break it, like Hitler did when he made a covenant with Russia in 1939-1940 and broke it on the 22nd of June 1941. It lasted 18 months. So that's going to happen. We know that's going to happen. The pattern was set. I'm going to read on here. Verse 11. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. Unwalled villages, you know what that word actually means in the Hebrew? It's perizar, it means open country. It means country where you don't have any problems getting through security walls. It means there won't be any walls or bars or gates to get through like there are now. That's why it goes on to say, I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely or securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. There probably won't even be a wall between Israel and Gaza. To take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. And many of you will know that that word midst is very important. It actually means the navel of the land. So where's your navel? I don't need to tell you where your navel is, do I? It's right in the middle of your body. Just like... Israel will dwell in the middle of the land. They don't today, except in the settlements that they're building in the West Bank. But it's telling you something. Both in verse 8, the phrase, the mountains of Israel, and in verse 12, you have clear statements that Israel will possess the West Bank as part of Israel proper at the time of Armageddon. That's what it's telling us. So let's have a look at that. So let's then review what Ezekiel 38 requires. 
It requires a dictator dominating the entire Eurasian continent to the north of Israel. In verses 5 and 6, it requires the territory east and north of Israel to be under Gogian control. It requires a dependent Europe, in verse 6, under Gog's political control, not military control, political control. And in verse 8, it requires that the West Bank be part of Israel proper. In verses 8 to 11, Israel must be at peace both internally and with its near neighbours. And it must be, as verse 12 told us, extremely prosperous and envied by other nations. Yemen, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, who are the Sheba and Dedan of verse 13, are the first to oppose the Gogian invasion, which tells us that they are the closest allies of Israel at the time. And they will be followed by Britain and the Young Lions, who will follow suit, verse 13. So that's what it requires. So let's examine this matter of the West Bank being part of Israel proper. As you've seen, it's clear from verse 8 and from verse 12. Now, 90% of the hills and the mountains in the central massif of the land of Israel, which runs, those mountains run from Hebron in the south up to Mount Gilboa in the north, are in the West Bank, 90% of those mountains. So when we read about Gog coming against the mountains of Israel, it's pretty clear, of course, what that territory is. Netanyahu is locked into annexation by his political allies now. So I'm going to point out he wasn't always that way. But here's another passage that needs to be considered. In Isaiah 10, verses 28 to 32, I'm not going to take you there for the sake of time. I'm just going to point out the names, but you can check me out, please. Point out the names in green up there. Now, I don't know where all of them are, but if you can see, if you've got good eyes, if you can see some red dots there just to the, to the left of the, the head of the Dead Sea. Can you see them? That's at least where some of these names are found. So the Assyrian of old and of the future, because this prophecy of Isaiah 10, if you examine it, it's got an application to ancient times and it's got a secondary application to our times, to the latter days. The Assyrian of old and of the future take the same path into the land. The pattern was set. And all of those towns are in there, inside that red ring. All of them. So what does that mean? <laughs> That's the West Bank today, isn't it? It is the West Bank. And Yahweh says they're coming down upon his people, upon his land, upon the land of Israel. Yeah, so it won't be a Palestinian state. So let's just have a quick review of the history of annexation. Since the 31st of December 2017, when the Likud party decided to ultimately annex the West Bank in the absence of their party leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, who didn't agree with that policy, much has changed. In the elections of 2020 and 22, all major parties had a policy of annexation of the West Bank. All of them, major parties. Netanyahu has reluctantly accepted the policy. You know why he was, he's reluctant? Well, because he's the Prime Minister. He's got to go and meet presidents, you know, like Putin and, and Biden and other people. He's got to go to G20s and whatever else. And they all want a two-state solution, and they all think it's going to be the West Bank. He doesn't want to have to butt heads with all these world leaders. It's uncomfortable. So he hasn't been keen on the policy, but he is now because he has to be, as I'll show you. In forming a multi-party government in late 2022, Netanyahu was forced to accept up front the demands of extreme right-wing parties in his coalition that the West Bank is the exclusive territory of Israel. They were not going to join his government unless he agreed to that. Now, this is a report, you, you may have seen some of this, this is from the United States Institute of Peace and they were commenting last January on the re-election of Netanyahu. And their question was, what does Israel's new government mean for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? And they point out that nearly 30 years since Oslo, that is the Oslo agreements in 1993, even rhetorical nods to the prospect of a two-state solution may be coming to an end. And this is the meat of that article I want for you. 
This is what he had to agree to. If Prime Minister Netanyahu, who has in the past flirted with, the co with commitment to a two-state future, the opening paragraph of the government's guidelines document, a non-legally binding but public expression of priorities, leaves no room for ambivalence. So here comes the agreement in the green. The Jewish people have an exclusive and inalienable right to all parts of the land of Israel. You couldn't be any clearer than that, could you? The document further includes a commitment to promoting and developing settlement accordingly to explicitly include the West Bank. Now, it was at 11.45 p.m. on the 31st of December uh, 2017 that the Liquid Party, in Netanyahu's absence, made the decision to ultimately annex the West Bank. That's how historical it is. Here's the articles. See the date? January the 8th, 2018. As reported on the Council of Foreign Relations website, that is the United States website, government website. On New Year's Eve, the Likud Party's Central Committee voted to extend Israel's legal jurisdiction to settlements in the West Bank. It is a legal nuance that seems insignificant against the backdrop of 50 years of occupation, but it has significant consequences. The move is a prelude to annexation. The move essentially establishes Israeli sovereignty over the land. The current US ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, appointed by Trump, is a financial supporter of settlements and objects to the term occupy, like I do, when referring to the West Bank. It goes on to say this. Minister for Public Security, Gilad Erdan, declared to the party leadership, we will now promote the recognition of our sovereignty of the Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria, as they call it. We must begin to enact this sovereignty. We have the moral right and obligation towards our settler brothers. Now, that was the statement made by him. Then the article comments, no one should be terribly surprised that Israel is embarking on annexation. It is entirely consistent with the greater Israel worldview of right of centre Israeli governments which, with brief interludes in the early 1990s and early 2000s, have dominated the political arena since 1977. So why is this happening, brothers and sisters? Well, it's happening because of the growing dependency of many nations on Israel. Once, of course, a basket case economically, but now prosperous in fulfilment of Ezekiel 38, verse 12. So I'm going to finish this study tonight by turning our minds to verse 12 of Ezekiel 38. See what it says? A people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst, the navel of the land. This is what Netanyahu said to the United Nations in his speech in September this year. I think it has much relationship to this phrase, which have gotten cattle and goods. This is what he said in part. Two weeks ago, we saw another blessing already in sight. He's just been referring to many blessings that are coming to the Middle East nations because of Israel. Yeah, blessings because of Israel. President Biden, in, in, he says, in, G, in the G20 conference, President Biden, Prime Minister Modi, that is the Prime Minister of India, a very close friend of Israel, by the way, and European and Arab leaders announced plans for a visionary corridor that will stretch across the Arabian Peninsula and Israel. It will connect India to Europe with maritime links, rail links, energy pipelines, fibre optic cables. This corridor will bypass maritime choke points, like the Suez Canal, and dramatically lower the costs of goods, communication and energy for over two billion people. Israel is right in the centre of it. I don't think there's any doubt where that's going to lead. Israel leads the world in technology and agriculture in arid climates. So let's just very quickly go through a few things about latter-day Israel and its prosperity. It's not always been that way, and it wasn't that way until about 15, 10 or 15 years ago. For four decades, socialist governments ruled Israel. You know what socialist governments produce, don't you? Ruin, financial ruin. There was economic sluggishness. But Ezekiel 38.12 requires prosperity at the time of Armageddon, 
And Benjamin Netanyahu, MBA, American educated, Prime Minister from 1996 to 1999 and then from 2009 basically right up to now except for about 18 months, reformed Israel's financial system in 2003. And you might recall that the Prime Minister of Israel in 2003 was Ariel Sharon. He hated Netanyahu because he saw him as a political rival, a challenger for the Prime Ministership. So he gave him the poison chalice. You know what the poison chalice is in Israel? The finance ministry. Yeah. The treasury, we call them in this country. I mean, no one was ever successful at it. It destroyed their political careers. He thought he would destroy Netanyahu's career. Didn't work out that way. Sharon, of course, had a massive stroke in early 2004, and he died 10 years later in 2014. Never woke up. He was replaced by Netanyahu, who, or, who had already instituted massive reforms in Israel. He turned their economy on its head. He boasts about this. Read his book. He boasts about it. But he did it. And he's made Israel what they are today. God has used him for that purpose. Israel prospers in many and varied fields. Computer technology, agriculture, arts, science, weapons development, oil and gas, and diamonds. Did you know that most diamonds cut? Look at, the, look at your wedding finger. The diamond on your finger was more than likely cut in Israel. 95% diamonds are cut in Israel. Isn't that incredible? That little country? Yeah. Israel and business. Israel has more NASDAQ. Now, NASDAQ is the index that they use for investment. So the NASDAQ listed companies it has more than any other country besides the United States, more than all of Europe, India, China and Japan combined in the aggregate. In proportion to its population, Israel has the largest number of startup companies in the world, over 3,000 of them. In absolute numbers, more than any other country besides the US. Israel has attracted the most venture capital investment per capita in the world, 30 times more than Europe. Relative to its size, Israel is the largest immigrant absorbing nation on earth. It has absorbed 350% of its population in 60 years. Israel has more Nobel Prizes per capita than the United States, France and Germany. It has more laureates in real numbers than India, Spain and China. Israel is the only country in the world that entered the 21st century with a net gain of trees, made more remarkable by the fact that it is 60% desert. We know that, we've just been driving through it. It is 60% desert. But they've got more trees now than any other nation on earth in terms of what they've planted. 93% of Israeli homes use solar energy for water heating, the highest percentage in the world. Israeli scientific research institutions are ranked third in the world. Israel is ranked second in space sciences. Israel is one of the ten countries in the world capable of launching its own satellites. Israeli universities are among the best in the world. Israel produces more scientific papers per capita than any other nation by a large margin, 109 per 10,000 people, as well as one of the highest per capita rates of patents filed. Israel has the third highest rate of entrepreneurship amongst women in the world. Israel's 300 billion US dollar economy is larger than all of its immediate neighbours combined. Israel leads the world in patents for medical equipment. Israel is one of the best healthcare systems in the world according to the OECD. That's why they did much better than most other nations in the COVID pandemic. In fact, if you want to get free of COVID, if you get COVID, get hold of an Israeli invention called Enovid. It, it is guaranteed, it's been tested to kill 99.9% .9 of not only COVID, but any other virus you might get in your nasal system. Israel is among the top three countries in cyber attack defence. Israel has the highest ratio of university degrees to population in the world. 24% hold college degrees and 12% hold advanced degrees. Israel is the second most educated country after Canada. But all of that has led to pride and arrogance and evil. I want you to come finally to Ezekiel 39. Ezekiel 39 verse 24. 
According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them and hid my face from them. Now, if you've got a pencil, a highlighting pencil, I use yellow because that's the, that's the pencil, that's the colour that the nations use. It's the colour that, that Israelis use for their own registration plates on their motor vehicles. That's the colour that Hitler put on them in the, in the, you know, the yellow star, right? So I'm, I use yellow because this is about Israel in their current state, not their future state, their current state. You should highlight one little phrase. It's in verse 23. It's about two-thirds of the way down the verse. It says, Therefore hid I my face from them. God has hidden his face from his people. Now what do you do when you hide your face from someone? When you walk into a group of people and someone doesn't want to look at you, what do you reckon that they feel about you? All right? You've had that happen to you, haven't you? People want to hide their face from you? I've had it happen to me. Yeah, they don't like you very much. They've got some problem with you. It occurs again at the end of verse 24. And hid my face from them. It occurs again in the beginning of verse 29. But this is different. This is when it's going to change. Neither will I hide my face anymore from them. He will have judged them. He will have purged them. He will have redeemed them. He won't need to hide his face from them anymore. But he is now. And you're all aware, of course, that most of those people that were killed in that so-called peace music event came from Tel Aviv. And Tel Aviv is the European capital for homosexuality. And they're proud of it. That's why Yahweh's hiding his face from his people. He's looking at the land, but he can't look at the people. And that day will come when that changes. But read on, verse 25. Therefore thus saith Adonai Yahweh, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob. So here comes their redemption. And have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, Jews in the land, Jews outside the land, and will be jealous of my holy name after that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they are trespassed against me. When? Now this is another word you should highlight. Because it tells you when this is going to happen. When they dwelt safely in their land. They don't dwell safely in their land today. So it's going to get worse. If we think it's bad now, it's going to be doubly worse when they get peace. Which is why Yahweh hides his face from them. When they dwelt safely in their land. That's, that's quoting Ezekiel 38, isn't it? When Gog comes down. That's years away. So here we've got the way that God feels about his people. When they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. But he will redeem them. But it will be very painful. The loss of two-thirds of the Jews in the land is part of the price to be paid. Recent massive oil and gas fines will make Israel self-sufficient for decades. Israel attributes its success to its own ingenuity and endurance under duress, oppression and attack, just like they're doing now. And many of the Holocaust generation ceased to believe in God, but he used them to create the state of Israel, not the religious Jews who were opposed to it. Did you know that? You know how many Jews, religious Jews, Orthodox Jews, who wear their black clothing, their lampstand hats, and they've got all their curls coming down? The, you, you know how many Jews like that who now live in Jerusalem? 220,000. And my family saw 95% of them in seven days because they have an obligation to come down to the wall almost every day of Sukkot, as they call it, Sukkoth, tabernacles. You could hardly move in the streets of Jerusalem. Israel will be ungodly at Christ's return. Paul says that in Romans 11, 25 and 26. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this secret, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. 
And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. They shall come out of Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And Isaiah 29, verses 22 and 23, tells us about the reaction of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, especially Jacob, because he will be immortal when this happens. Hopefully, together with you and me, brothers and sisters, we'll see this. He will be immortal, and he will see this. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh, who redeemeth Abraham, concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now be ashamed, like Yahweh, who's hidden his face from his own people. If Jacob was alive today, he would be hiding his face from his own family. Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. But when he seeth his children, the work of my hands, Yahweh will redeem his people in the midst of him. They shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. Oh, for that day, brothers and sisters.